interested if the ones that claim to know him aren't excited. If what you've got only makes you miserable, then number one, nobody else is going to want it. And number two, you didn't get the right thing. Or you didn't get enough of it. Amen? So praise the Lord. We're excited about the goodness of God and what He's going to do. Uh, this message today, I'm challenging your heart and I'm getting out in front of it to challenge you about an event that's going to take place at this church on George Washington's birthday. Um, I am not so much a numbers guy in that I think everything goes by numbers. I think sometimes the whole number thing is like overdone. Uh, you know, like, well, today's the third, so I'm going to look at the third chapter, the third verse of the third book, and that's God's word for me. Well, it might be. And you might get the wrong date, and it might be a verse that says Judas went out and hung himself, and you might try again that says go thou and do likewise. So I'm not sure we're just supposed to take those blind shots in the dark. I do believe we serve a God that does work with numerology. I just think everything has to be put in its proper perspective. Is that fair enough? I do believe that God uses the number seven a lot. I do believe that there are numbers that are significant. I do believe when we talk about the mark of the beast or the number of his name being 666. It is literally the trinity of man. It is the trinity of humanness mixed with evil. And God's number would be 777. Come on, somebody. His, <laughs> he would be one up and be perfect overall. Amen? So I do believe there's significance. So having said that, I, we are intentional about this number but it's also because it's a Friday night and that's when this works but Friday night February 22nd we're going to have all night prayer here at the church and I don't want you to just automatically dismiss that and say well pastor I'm not a night person and I can't do that and I can't make it through the night listen no one's going to condemn you if you come and you end up falling asleep on the pew I believe this, that we need to put forth the effort. We need to put forth the effort. I believe God blesses effort and God blesses heart. I want to share some things with you today that are, I believe is absolutely amazing in that God can use one single event from one single day, from one single night that literally changes the course and the destiny of eternity. I'm going to prove that by Scripture. I know this. If it's something that you just like really, really, really like to do, like, you know, I mean, I know we're in the city and there's probably not too many uh, uh, avid coon hunters, but I do know if you're going to be a coon hunter, it's an all-night thing. Just like, just for fun, has anybody in here ever been coon hunting? Okay, about one person. But it's an all-night thing. And you stay up all night. Because coons move at night. But there's plenty of times that we'll stay up all night without purpose. How many have been up all night with a sick child? How many have been up all night sick yourself? I hate to even mention this one, but how many just been up all night worrying because the devil's aggravating you and you just can't seem to turn your mind off? All three of us. No, I see your hands going up all... So why don't we like on purpose? Let me ask you a question. I'm going to say this now and say it later. How much do you really love your loved ones? How much do you really care whether they know Jesus as their Savior? Let me ask you, are you willing to give up one night of your life to see that they're not sleepless for eternity? Not that we'll need sleep in heaven, but I can tell you there is no sleep in the regions of the damned. There is no rest. There is no peace. Now I'm going to tell you straight up, I intend to be here. And I'm going to tell you also straight up, sometime before that night's over, you're probably going to say, the pastor fell asleep. So I'm just going to get right out in front of that right now. And I'm also going to tell you that God's still going to bless me. And He's going to look down from heaven between whatever pew I've, I've passed out under. And He's going to say, God bless the boy, He's trying. 
And so having put that right out in front, you come. I, got, I started saying sleep with the pastor, but that would be really terrible. I just like, you just come and sleep here at the church wherever you're at. And I mean, you got to be real careful nowadays. And you know, people take things and just twist it around backwards. But <sighs> y'all so look so much better now. One, one, one pastor, he had trouble with people sleeping in his church. And so he went to an elderly pastor, took a weekend off. And uh, he said, brother, I want to come. He said, because I'm really burdened. And he said, I need help. And he said, well, that's fine. He said, just come and observe. And he said, I have similar challenges. And so he went. And sure enough, people started falling asleep in this man's church. He was an older pastor. And all of a sudden, the older pastor just stopped. And he said, the best years of my life was spent in the arms of another man's wife. And everybody in the church woke up. <gasps> he paused and he said, My sainted mama held me in her arms as a little baby, loved on me and nurtured me, and I'm the man I am today because of her. And a young pastor, he thought, Wow, that was amazing. He said, I'm going to use that. So he went back to his church, and the next week, sure enough, people started falling asleep. And he stopped and he said, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And there was this <gasps> gasp. And I mean, even worse than that, the other church, they were just, <gasps> like that. Yeah. And it scared him. And he said, and I can't even remember her name. It just scared him so bad. So, you know, if you're going to use shock effect, you need to remember the whole thing. He, he just said, shocked him so bad. He, he couldn't remember the next line. But how many know that is the best years of your life? When you were carefree. When somebody else had all the responsibility and you was getting all the love. How, how many, come on somebody, help me today. All the responsibility and you got all the love. How many know that God still wants to give to us all the love, but He wants us to take some of the responsibility? So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. You say, well, pastor, I just can't do that. I work so hard and I just get home exhausted. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. You know what I do believe? If we'll put forth the effort, we'll find God will give us what we didn't even know we could do and what we didn't even think we could do. And guess what? I might even surprise you and you may not catch the pastor sleeping at all. I might even make it through the whole night. But we're going to leave everybody in the main sanctuary for security purposes. We're going to encourage the kids just to have sleeping bags. We'll put them up all along that ridge. We'll open those Sunday school rooms or whatever. We'll, we'll have worship time. But I believe this. We need to teach our kids how to pray too. You know, I don't read anywhere in the Bible that God don't hear your prayers unless you're a certain age. Samuel was already destined to be the prophet for the nation by the age of eight. Called from his mother's womb. Wow. Let's not sell our kids short. You know, years and years ago, there was an amazing revival that broke out in Mexico. And God started using this little girl to just walk up to prominent businessmen and like read their mail. And they were just being like exposed. I mean, sins were like being brought to light. They were like, I mean, they were like reduced to tears, sobbing and crying. And like everything you just said is right and I need to repent. And how many know we just better not shoot the messenger? Because, hello. Or try to discredit the message because we don't like the package. Amen? Because God can use whoever He wants. Whenever He wants however he wants and we just need to acknowledge and so today's message is called the tipping point and i just got to share this real quick because this was this was pretty cool bob and i were praying in my office this morning we get together for prayer and and uh he was praying and he mentioned tipping point now we've we've prayed together and i've been around bob a lot and i've never heard him say that and so I got so excited, I whipped my lip, laptop out of my case, 
And I sat down on the couch and I opened it up. I said, look, I said, I want you to see this right now so you know I didn't have time to type this after the fact or I didn't have time. <laughs> this was already in this before I walked in the door. So I just want you to understand, I've already got one confirmation to this message today. And I believe this is a word for all of us. How many, just, just, just out of curiosity today, how many of you really been praying for a loved one for a lot of years? How many of you got a father or a mother or sister or brother or grandkids or somebody that you just can't bear to think of them being lost forever? When you think about it, it just... And you see that basically they can be a good person and a hard worker and a lot of good traits. But how many know good don't make it to heaven? Saved does. Good don't make it anywhere. Redeemed does. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be good. But it, 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 look, you know, the problems with so many people that get a religious spirit is they try to clean up people before they're ever converted. I did a lot of fishing as a kid. And you never clean a fish before you catch it. We've been called to be fishers of men. And I think for the most part, the church has stopped fishing, and a lot of the other part of the church in general is practicing catch and release. This is not just one time thing. Oh yeah, I came to church when I was 12 years old, I prayed to prayer and I'm good for life. No, you're not. That makes about as much sense as saying, you know, 39 years ago, I said, I do to my wife right down here, and that's good enough, and you know, we're... No! We've been I doing for 39 years. Hallelujah. And I intend to I do until I'm done. Amen? It's till death do us part. We make it to August 25th, it'll be 40 years. But the same lady. Surely, they ought to have a parade for us. Hallelujah. And it's like, listen, so many things in life are just being consistent, just being faithful, just showing up, just being somebody that can be depended on. So I'm challenging you right now. And I know, in, in, I know listen, I know in theory this doesn't work, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. I'm telling you this, about this so far in advance that what I want you to do is take several 10-minute naps between now and the 22nd. So by the time you reach the 22nd, you'll have accrued a whole extra free night of sleep. <laughs> I'm tempted right now to say how many with God's grace will, but I'll just wait and preach and I won't put you on the spot. But listen, if you'll make the effort... What would happen if you make the effort and all of a sudden everything changes in your family? What do, you, do you think you'd like, man, I, I'm, boy, I, I, I'm sure, mm, I'm sure disappointed I did that. Or would you spend an eternity wondering what could have been if I'd have took the challenge? I know one thing, none of us want to stand at a funeral home or in front of a casket and say, how could have things been better if I'd have been willing to give up one night? Just one night. A tipping point is that's what happens when the final thrust, the one more push, the final ounce of weight that tips the scales to the positive side. I do know this, if we keep doing what we've always done, we'll keep getting what we've always got. And that becomes the definition of insanity. Whether it be in your marriage, your work, your family, or the way you serve God, there comes a time that you need to put forth that little bit of extra effort. Now I'm not saying anybody even needs what I'm getting ready to say next, so let me just preface it by saying that. But let me also challenge you that if you enter into marriage or you're in marriage and you're looking at it as a 50-50 thing, you're setting yourself up for failure. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's some days when it might be a hundred to nothing. 
Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? If your loved one's sick and they need all your attention and they're not able to reciprocate, 50-50 not going to get it. But what would happen if each one of us approached that relationship with the desire to be the one that gives the most? Hopefully I'm stepping on all our toes starting right here. But what would happen if we tried to outdo one another with acts of kindness? Hello? What would happen if for the rest of our life the only time of the only thing of I'll get you back for that is we're trying to dream up a way to bless somebody who just blessed us? How many think that sounds like a plan? How many know if you're a normal thinking person, it'd be real hard to stay mad at someone who's doing nice things for you? My wife fixed me an awesome breakfast this morning. Now, she didn't do it because she needed to score any brownie points. She just did it because she's good. And it was all. What would happen if we approach every relationship with the idea, I want to give more than I take? You know, there's an unwritten code among RVers, people that travel and camp. And the unwritten code is this. Always leave the campsite better than you found it. How many know real people don't leave a bunch of trash hanging around? You know, these, these, these plastic phony baloney people that are all the time, you know, Mother Earth stuff, they'll go to Washington, D.C. for Earth Day celebration and leave behind tons of trash all over and they'll have a conservative group show up to pray or something and they can't even find a speck of paper thank god for that that's a good testimony to the body of christ but it's a shouting hypocrisy to those who just trash everywhere they go and act like they care don't get mad at the truth hello so i believe that this all-night prayer will have the desired effect that will push us past the critical point. Wouldn't that be awesome if that's just the extra shove we need, the tipping point that starts things in momentum in the direction we all desire and need to go? What if we look back six months from now if Jesus tarries and we point at that day on the calendar and say, that's the day everything changed. I do know this. When God gets ready to do something, He always goes back to the roots. I do believe there's a mighty revival coming to this region because George Washington, the founder and father of our country, was born right here. Just a few rock throws from where I'm standing, if you got a good arm, and he was born on the 22nd of February. What would happen if God leans over the balcony of heaven and says, that's the tipping point I was waiting for. Somebody to call on me and ask me to go back to the roots and bless again because though the tree be cut down to the ground, if the roots are left in the ground, the sin of water, it can blossom again. It can spring forth again because God is not finished until it's all done. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the one that can take nothing and turn it into awesome. Oh, I feel that. Hallelujah. When I was a kid, never forget this. Behind the house where I lived was a cornfield. And it was a big, huge cornfield. This is probably about a hundred acre track of land. And the closest house in this field was probably a good, good half mile away. And one day was I, I was out back playing as a kid in the backyard of this house where we grew up. And a fighter jet came over about a hundred feet off the ground. In fact, I really believe it was even lower than that. Flying at an amazing speed and a sonic boom that followed. I never forgot it. 1,100 feet per second. And when that jet broke that sonic, that exceeded the speed of 1,100 feet per second, 
And the, the, the percussion that came off of that thing. Listen, I'm 60 years old. I'm, I'm estimating I was probably six or seven at that time. I ain't never forgot it. What would happen if our prayers on the 22nd of February create in the spirit world a sonic boom? You know, thank God for Google. I know there's a lot of mess and a lot of whatever and whatever, but it, it can be a blessing. And, and I was working on this last night, and I asked my wife, I said, I said, Google sonic boom for me. Because I wanted to make sure I was speaking correctly. And, and I, I remembered something about a sonic boom, and I wanted to make sure I was remembering it right. There's something that is really awesome about a sonic boom. When you reach subsonic speeds, which is below the sonic boom threshold, there's an increase of resistance. But when you finally press through and break through that sound barrier, resistance greatly diminishes. What if all our lives spiritually, I wish somebody would help me right now, what if all our lives spiritually we've been flying just just a little bit behind. We're flying. We're serving God. We're, we're trying to do what's right. But what, what if we're just at about 1,050 feet per second? What if we can't do just, no matter what we try, we just can't seem to break through that? What, what, what would happen? What in our spiritual life if we just threw a few things out that would lighten? What if we just increased a little of this that would produce more thrust? What would happen? Check this out. Because this is cool. An aircraft able to operate for extended periods at supersonic speeds has a potential range advantage over a similar design operating subsonically. Most of the drag an aircraft sees while speeding up to supersonic speeds occurs just below the speed of sound due to an aerodynamic effect known as wave drag. An aircraft that can accelerate past this speed sees a significant drag decrease and can fly supersonically with improved fuel economy. I believe in that book there's somewhere a verse that we should all know and love that says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What happens if you're doing just enough that's just slap wearing you out, but you're not having a breakthrough? What happens if you're just doing enough that the resistance is so bad that everything in your spiritual aircraft is just shaking like it's going to fly apart and you say, I don't know how much more of this I can, I can stand and instead of shoving the throttle forward and trying to work through it, you back off. And you keep doing that over and over and over and over again. There has to come a forward thrust. There has to become a change of momentum. We've either got to put more horsepower or firepower or we've got to go to a higher grade of fuel or we've got to lighten our load or we've got to do something that we can reach a speed that we're no longer just hovering below an area where we can't be at our maximum efficiency because how many think in these last days we need to be running with the eagles and running with the horses and doing what God's called us to do and not being diminished and not being defeated and not being depleted but being added on to and multiplied by the power of God. Oh, I feel that. How many ready for some supersonic flight? Whew. You know, I, I never I never flew on the Concorde. I, I saw it, I've watched it take off. It, it was it was crazy looking, it was wild. What some of you may or may not know, you know, that the, the, the nose was like this. But once it it, it got to like cruising speed, the nose straighten out like that. And crossing the ocean would take you seven to eight hours. I think eight hours going over, seven coming back because of the tailwind. 
this plane could do it in about three to three and a half hours. If I remember right, the average ticket was somewhere around 10 grand. And they did okay for a while because there's a lot of like high-flying businessmen that's super wealthy that didn't care about it, just wanted that extra time because how many know once you spend time, you never get it back? And they didn't want to be on that jet all night long and on and on and on and on. They wanted to get there quick and do what... And But one of the things that, that, that finally doomed these flights as I was reading about was too many people begin to complain about the sonic boom. There's always somebody that's going to complain about the sonic boom. I think I'm saying, saying this right because we have the military present and I certainly don't want to misspeak. I think it's Cherry Point. And at Cherry Point, there's a big sign that talks about the jets. And it says, and I'm paraphrasing, but it says, don't let that bother you. It's the sound of freedom. I, I, am I saying it right? It is Cherry Point. I think, yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Whew, hallelujah. The sound of freedom. What would happen if a sound of freedom went up from this church on the 22nd of February that shook all of heaven and all the angels momentarily stopped what they were doing? And what would happen? I believe there's open heavens over this church. But what would happen if at that moment God designed a portal over this house straight to His throne? What would happen if we went from open heavens to unlimited access? What would happen? I, I just want, look, I want. I hope everybody's listening. I want you to lend me your best ear. Been in 33 countries of the world. Only flew first class in my life, I think, twice. And once I was just upgraded, just the grace of God. Stewardess just come back and said, come with me. Next thing I knew, I was sitting in first class. I did fly with the pilot on one flight, and that's the God's honest truth, but that's another story. That was really awesome. I was in the cockpit with the pilot. And you might say, no. Let me just say it was before 9-11. It was before, it was before everything got crazy. But I did. I abs absolutely did. But I was with a group that was going to Abuja, Nigeria to... A Reinhard Bonnke crusade, and we were all urged to fly what I call "quote unquote" business class, because they said we want to keep together as a group, and uh, we don't want anybody to be bumped or canceled along the way. And so, we had all ponied up the money. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't ten grand. It wasn't anything like that. But it was it was significantly more than than I'd ever paid before. But God provided, and we went. But I'm gonna tell you, before we landed in London, England. I was really happy that I was in business class because I was really getting tired. And it felt really good to lay down about 3 o'clock in the morning and not be setting up with all the blood pooling around your ankles. Do you know you are more susceptible to a heart attack after an overseas flight than any other time? When you've sat there and there's no circulation and you've just sat there for so long and sat there for so long, that those next hour, hour and a half, two hours after you get up and start moving, there can be blood clots that are formed during that time. You know, you have to stay active. They're, they're constantly telling people at work now, don't just sit all day, stand up. They've even got new desks that they've designed to raise it up so you can stand and type for a while because you've got to kind of stay moving a little bit. You've got to keep everything moving. How many know if you don't move it, you'll lose it? Somebody shout yes. So, are we willing to give up a single night of sleep to see God turn things around? In our lives, our families, our church, our nation, will we be willing to give up a night of sleep so our loved ones won't be sleepless for eternity? 
I want to direct you to these passages of Scripture. And this won't take long because I've pretty well already given it to you up front. Now I want to give you the Scripture. Genesis 32, 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to thy brother Esau. And also he comes to meet you and 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands. How many know if you've ripped off people in the last time you had a meeting with them, you're not probably too excited to see them again? That's what's going on here. Okay? If Esau, and then Jacob says, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So he's doing all this plotting behind the scenes. Now he gets serious. He starts to pray. Verse 9, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he looked, and he lodged, and as he, and he lodged rather there that same night, and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau his brother. And verse 22, And he rose up that night and took his two wives, his two women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabok. And literally the word Jabok means crossing over or transition. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Everybody say, all night long. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray, what is your name? Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means champion with God. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his now. Here is an amazing thing. Here's this guy named Jacob, which means heel catcher, supplanter, deceiver. He's ripped off his brother. He stole his birthright. He gets news. Esau's on his way with 400 armed soldiers. You're about to meet your Waterloo. You're about to pay for all the mess you've paid. How many think he didn't sleep all night long? I guarantee he didn't sleep all night long. But what did he get for one night prayer meeting? Right up front he got his name changed, which meant a character change. Back in Bible days, kids were named and it was an amazing thing. Parents stood over their children and blessed them and God allowed them to live up to their name. It was an amazing thing. There was a lot of thought that went in the name. It wasn't just arbitrary. And that child literally took on the character and nature of their name. So much so that some would even like later, you know, want to be changed like ben to Benjamin because ben means son of my sorrows. You know, who wants to be a walking depression? Amen? So his father named him Benjamin instead of ben but guess what? That isn't all that happened. I mean, you know, if that was all it was, that would not be too shabby for a one-night prayer meeting. Can I get a witness? And he's got a nation named after him. Did I happen to mention that? May 15, 1948, a nation was born called Israel, which became his name. And the name Israel came from right here, of this one-night, all-night prayer meeting. But check this out. In Revelation 21.10, I'm told, And He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even a, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall, great and high. And had a wall, great and high. And had twelve gates. 
I ain't going to say nothing. I'm just like, I'm just saying, I ain't going there. I'm not taking no temptations or, or any suggestions. I'm just saying, it had a wall, great and high. And had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the gates of the holy city for all eternity are going to be the names of Israel's sons. Because of an all night prayer meeting. Now I will ask for a show of hands on this one. How many think you'd be willing to show up and put forth the effort if, if, if somehow you could be guaranteed that on the 22nd of February, if you came here and prayed all night, something would happen that would change everything for eternity? I mean, that's the biggest no-brainer on the planet, is it not? Well, can I ask you this question? Is there a scripture that says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Is there another scripture that says, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed? So I ask you, if the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel would do that for Him, would He still do it for you and me? I said, would He still do it for you and me? Would He still do it for you and me? I want to challenge you. Why don't you show up and give him a chance? Jonathan Edwards, after an all-night prayer meeting, climbed into the pulpit. And his nearsightedness was so extreme that even with his glasses on, he had ink smudge on his nose when he finished reading his sermon. He didn't even look up. But the anointing of God and the conviction was so strong, people were crying out in the congregation, please, Mr. Edwards, please stop. I feel like I'm sliding into hell. And they were grabbing hold of the pillars of the church. But from that one all-night prayer meeting and the sermon that followed the next morning, 300,000 people were swept into the kingdom of God as revival broke out across New England and the northern colonies. And God ministered and met this nation. That really wasn't even a nation yet, may I add. We were colonies under the king. A nation in destiny. And God showed up. Wow! On the island of Hebrides, which is an island loosely off the coast of England, Scotland, in that area, just in case you are wondering... Four deacons showed up for an all-night prayer meeting. They said, God, your honor is at stake. You said if we would pray and humble ourselves, you would hear from heaven. God, we need help, and we're calling on you. At two o'clock in the morning, they said a wind hit that church so strong that the stone building was shaking like a leaf in the wind. They said when the wind subsided and they went outside, I want you to listen to this, when the wind subsided and they went outside, they said a light was on in every single house on the island. God literally shook everybody out of bed and they were on their knees crying out to God for forgiveness. At 6 o'clock in the morning, there was already over 400 people at the police station confessing of crimes and trying to make restitution and get things right. The Welsh revival of 1904. Evan Roberts, 17 years old, asked his pastor if he could speak. The pastor just said, well, you can speak it when the service is over if anybody cares to stay. And the pastor went home. Evan Roberts got up with no formal training, no, no, no Bible school, no theological background. And he said these words, Oh God, bend us. When he said bend us, all of a sudden the power of God fell on that place and they were still there at 4 o'clock in the morning and over 100,000 people would be swept into the kingdom of God and it would so affect the mining community of Wales that it literally shut down the mines as they had to bring the mules out from underground and retrain them because no one was cursing anymore and all the mules had been trained with curse words. The crime rate so fell in Wales that policemen had nothing to do, so they were coming to the church and forming groups of quartets, and a quartet of policemen would come and sing during the revival. 
Court cases were canceled because people were making restitution and the jails emptied out because God showed up. Because one 17-year-old kid had enough temerity and tenacity to say, oh God, bend us. And God said, that's the tipping point. That was what I was waiting to hear. That's the sonic boon. Now something is going to happen in the heavenlies. I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. I don't have somebody say, I'm ready for a sonic boom. Come on, somebody. I'm ready for a tipping point. I'm ready for things to turn around in my life. My wife and I was watching something on TV, and it was, a, it was, it was like a game show, and we were watching it together. And, and uh, this lady on there, she said, she wasn't doing too good. She said, hey, wait, wait a minute, everybody, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. She had everybody to play stand up. She said, we're going to do what we do at our church. We're going to get up. And she said, on the count of three, she said, I want everybody to shout Shondo and turn to the right two times. And so she hollered, Shondo! And everybody turned around. I thought, oh my word, what are we doing? And so we called on blessed Google. What in the world does Shondo mean? And sure enough, it means to turn it around. And so she had that whole audience shouting, Shondo, turn it around. I just want to say right now, why don't we put out a few Shondos for February 22nd and believe God to turn around everything in your life, everything in your family, everything in this nation, everything in this church. Hallelujah! Come on, on the count of three, somebody holler, Shondo, one, two, three. <laughs> Woo. First Samuel fifteen eleven. God speaking to Samuel he says, It repents me that I've set up Saul to be king, for he's turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Second Samuel twelve sixteen. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. So we see others that have spent all night in prayer. God help us to get desperate for Him without being put in a desperate situation. I know you've heard me say that before. I'm going to say it one more time. May we get desperate for God without being put in a desperate situation. I'd rather just go ahead and seek Him than to be forced into a crisis. I'd rather just go ahead and seek Him than to have to pace the floor crying out to God to try to intervene in some crisis. Why don't we just for once in our church life get ahead of the situation instead of just trying to react? Why don't we be proactive? Instead of just reacting to everything the devil's just done to try to mess us up and jack us up, why don't we get out in front and jack him up and mess him up? Many, many, many years ago, I was watching a movie. I was a heathen back then, okay? But I remembered one line from that movie. This man was surrounded by a bunch of ruffians. And he said, my daddy always told me, son, if you know you're getting ready to get a licking and you can't avoid it, he said, get in the first lick. And he come in. <laughs> How about let's just get in some licks for the glory of God? How about somebody just count that night on your calendar as holy revenge against the enemy? How many say it's time to make the devil pay for all the grief he's caused in your life? It's time to make him pay. It's time to seek the Lord until He come and rain righteousness upon you. Luke 6.12 and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. That's speaking of Jesus. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was God all by himself. And yet he prayed all night. Wow. So what will history say of our praying? What will God do for us? You know, I think it's wrong to just simply complain about our situation and our lot and do nothing to change it. I mean, it's like, it's like being around a bunch of people and, you know, it's been pleasant all day, but now the sun's gone down, it's getting really chilly and there's windows up and 
Everybody's sitting there saying, boy, it's getting chilly in here. And nobody gets up and closes the window. Hey, am I hearing what I'm saying? Or somebody goes by and sees a whole bunch of stuff out of place. And, well, somebody ought to do something about that. Well, who are you? How many think it's time we just take ownership? Maybe it's time to say, I looked around for someone else and I realized it was me. Tipping point. Tipping point. So I'm going to challenge you. 22nd of February. Giving you plenty of time to get it on your calendar. Giving you plenty of time. Pastor friend of mine. He told us this. Brother Jimmy like brought it to my remembrance. He's a good friend of mine. I've held many, many revivals for. He's now retired from pastoring. He still goes out and speaks. But he said one night, close to bedtime, he just got feeling really bad. And it wouldn't go away. And he said he ended up praying all night long. And he said long about morning, he got to feeling okay and everything was fine. And he said, Lord, I don't understand that. He said, I know you just touched me. He said, why didn't you touch me last night? And he said, God spoke to him and said, that's the first time you've ever stayed up all night praying. If Jesus had to pray all night and He was the Son of God, maybe you and I ought to like try that. I'm just saying, maybe that might just be like, how many know it was pretty much an all-night prayer meeting in the garden before He was arrested? And He came back to His disciples. It's watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And then He went back and prayed some more. And then He came back and said, I'll just sleep on now and take your rest. He said, the time's at hand. But I really believe that sleep that fell over those disciples in that garden was such a heavy oppression because of the intensity of the spiritual warfare and they were not at that level. I don't believe it was a normal physical thing of weariness. And I believe whether some of us realize it or not, we're under those same types of pressure and pressure sometimes that we don't even realize. Sometimes you don't even know the pressure you're under until you just step back from the situation. Just a little bit. And you feel the release. I've been in countries where you could literally feel the darkness. You feel the oppression. And while I was just there for 10 days, I thought about the people that are there for all their life. I just believe God's about ready to do something. And I don't know about you, but I want to be right slap dab right up in the middle of it. Up to my ears. I don't want to miss it. I don't, hello? I don't want to be one of that 380 plus that weren't there on the day of Pentecost. And those 120 are telling them the rest of their life, boy, you sure missed that church service. Boy, boy, you, you, you sure blew it on that one. That was, that was a rough, that was a bad decision to stay home that day. So, no condemnation, no guilt trip, but a challenge, an exhortation. How, how many think sometimes we just need to throw down? I'm just going to throw down the, hello, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to just, I'm gonna just throw it down. There it is. You pick it up and do something about it. You say, well, I'd like to come, but my husband don't want me out that late at night. Well, then I'll tell you what. You tell your husband either to come with you or we'll make sure she don't leave until it's clear daylight outside. Amen? Nobody be traveling in any danger. Say, well, I don't want to miss my wife for a night. Well, maybe you'll even treat her better when she gets home. Somebody shout you, oh, I'm... I said, oh, pastor, you better quit now. You're going to meddle. No, maybe we... Hey, maybe we would all just appreciate something a little better if we... I love the way some of y'all smiling. Whew. Okay. I'm done. I'm going to ask you one more question. 
How many be willing to just even pray about whether the Lord wants you here on the 22nd? Thank you. I see all kinds of hands going up on it. How many, how many reckon what you think he might say? <laughs> I just want to go out on a limb up in here and I just want to ask you, what do you think he might say? Providing? I think I heard it. Somebody say that again. I think you need to go. I, he might just, that sounds like, what do you think he might just say? Hallelujah. Come on, stand with me. I'm done. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Look, I don't want anybody to get in a hurry. You don't have to go stand in no line today at some restaurant. Food is here. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to have a great time of fellowship. Then we're going to have an afternoon service. Pastor Stacy's going to bring an awesome throwdown message. She don't normally do this, but she even like just share just a little smidgen of it. And I know it's going to be good. But we're going to take our time and just enjoy one another. Have fellowship. But I want you to meet me right here. Will you do that as is our custom? And we're going to pray together before we release you to the other building. Hallelujah. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Now, there's an afternoon service because there's no night service. But how many that have been here the last two Sunday nights have just been like off the chain? It's been, I mean, God is just like, fool. I'm telling you. I say this in love. I'm not throwing rocks. But you do not know the full flavor of what goes on at this house and this church if you're only here on Sunday morning. I mean, God showed up. And He is showing up. And He's about to do something awesome in all of our lives. Oh, i got to tell you this real quick. Evan Roberts began to write letters to a Baptist preacher in Los Angeles by the name of Joseph Small. How that connection happened, I'm not sure other than it was a God thing. I guess Joseph Small heard about the Welsh Revival. The Welsh Revival went from 1904 to 1905. 1906, the Azusa Street Revival happened and it went to 1909. But I want you to hear this. Evan Roberts was writing to Joseph Small and instructing this Baptist preacher to pray for revival to hit the city of Los Angeles because it was an international city and if God moved on that city, it would, it would touch the whole world. What he said was spot on because missionaries went out from the Azusa Street Revival literally to all over the world. People came to Azusa Street, were touched, took it back to their communities. There would later be an outpouring in Topeka, Kansas. There would later be an outpouring in Cumberland, Maryland. There were regions that were touched and impacted and changed because of what happened at the Azusa Street Revival because Evan Roberts wrote to Joseph Small and said, pray for revival. Meanwhile, a one-eyed black gentleman in Texas who was being discriminated against trying to go to Bible school and trying to learn, and then some places had to sit out in the hall and listen through the door. God was working in his life, and he was led by the Holy Spirit to go to Los Angeles, and he knocked on the door of two white ladies at 10.30 at night, and there was a curfew on, and nobody was even supposed to be on. There had been like the great earthquake of 1906 in Los Angeles and all the time. There was a curfew on, and he knocked on the door at 10.30. I'm going to tell you, you talk about somebody knows who they are and knows what they carry and knows whose God they serve. When that white lady opened that door and she looked at him, he said, I am the answer to your prayer. They let him in. They begin to have services in a house. 
And finally, the meeting got so big, the porch collapsed on the house, and they moved it to 312 Azusa Street, which was over a livery stable that had shut down. Dusty, smelly, musty livery stable. But there God chose to put His glory. There the fire of God fell. There a miracles took place, and people were saved and transformed for the glory of God. Hallelujah! There were some nights they would see flames leaping off the roof of the building and the policemen from the Los Angeles Fire Department would come and stand and with their hoses and just look and say, it's burning but it's not on fire. Whew. Oh, let me say that one more time. It's burning but it's not on fire. Oh God. Oh God. I, I, I dare somebody say it with me. Oh God, do it again. Come on somebody. Oh God, do it again. Oh God, do do it again. Oh God, do it again. Do it. Do it again. Do it again. Lord, we love You. We praise You. We bless You. And we adore You. My Lord, touch our hearts. Father, I pray in each one of us You will put a passion and a hunger and a desire and Lord, I pray that they'll even be pre-prayer leading up to the 22nd. That we'll even begin to seek Your face. God, on that day, on that day, we're believing You for incredible miracles. On that day, we're believing You for incredible breakthrough. On that day, we're believing You for a, 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 a sonic boom and a supersonic acceleration and a tipping point to take place. In Jesus' name, Lord, we declare it so according to Your glory and Your riches in heaven that are inexhaustible. Lord, I praise You. Now, Father, I pray You'd bless our fellowship as we partake together and break bread, Lord. May we enjoy one another and have a blessed day. To, we'll give You praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Real quick, because it's probably easier for me to give you these instructions here than to wait over there when I don't have a mic in my hand. We, we do have like a friendly cook-off and we have like gift cards for first, second, and third place. And so, here's what I'm asking you to do though, please. There's like little small containers.